We're here with the poet Billy Collins in beautiful downtown St. Paul. Uh, it sounds like lunch at Sardi's. There's an old radio <laughs> program where I think, I guess it was broadcast from Sardi's, probably, but they had this kind of... Uh, really? Huh. I think, I think it could have been in the studio, and they just had kind of dishes and sure. in the background. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or my dinner with Andre. <laughs> yeah, we could say that. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. Uh, that movie holds up really well. Oh, I agree. Um, so unlike so many poets in America, you have the uh, privilege of reading before some very large audiences, uh, big theaters and so forth. Uh, what, what kind of challenges come with doing poetry readings in that environment? Um, well, uh, let's see. I can't think of any challenges. I mean, it's more of like an opportunity. Uh, I mean, it's... I mean, I was on NPR last night on Prairie Home Companion, and that's an audience, although one doesn't think about it when one is on stage, but you're in front of a thousand people at the Fitzgerald Theater here in St. Paul, but you're reading to a radio audience of about three to four million people. So, um, I mean, NPR really, if you, if you an embarrass, it's an embarrassing subject to talk about one's own fame, so to speak, but if I do enjoy a fairly broad audience, it's uh, almost entirely due to, N to National Public Radio, mm -hmm. to being on Terry Gross and being on Prairie Home Companion, where you do have an audience, not only of three or four million people listening, but these are kind of a perfect poetry audience. They're college-educated, for the most part, middle-class, book-buying people. Right. Um, right. So, you know, Joseph Epstein, I'm drifting, but he, he wrote an essay quite a few years ago, in the late 90s, I guess, about mm -hmm. the state of poetry. And he said, if, uh, he said, if I had to describe the state of contemporary poetry in America, I would say it's flourishing in a vacuum. <laughs> and that summarizes a lot. And I think, um, you know, we know in the last 20 years there's been an explosion of uh, MFA programs and readings and I mean right now probably 50 poets are vectoring over the skies going to some podium <laughs> somewhere um, and uh, but it does but most of the audience for that are poets or people who want to be poets or are there for the open mic and uh, so there's all the, it's a closed circuit right but I think you know when you get an opportunity to read to uh, hundreds or thousands of people or tens of thousands but, then, um, or a million, then, then you're, I hope the circuit is being broken somewhat so that people who have no vested interest are coming back to poetry. Right, right. Do you think poetry's place in American culture changed after 9 11 in any way? Um, I don't think, I think right after 9 11, there was a, uh, there was a call for poetry. There was not a call for ballet or uh, sculpture uh, in the way that there was a call for poetry. What should we be reading? You know, I was named Poet Laureate months before 9-11. So there was a lot of, again, National Public Radio. Uh, what poem should we turn to? Turn to is an interesting verb in that case. Um, it implies that poetry was there all along, but now we're turning to it. We're not finding it. We're we're, we've been turning our backs on it, mm -hmm. and now we're turning toward it. Um, but, I mean, we know historically poetry uh, has, has been, been brought into the work of, uh, of consolation, because mm -hmm. you hear it at funerals and at times of stress, well, even at weddings, speaking of a time of stress. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I think, uh, you know, within a year after 9-11, I think... Uh, Things returned as they will to uh, the state they were in before 9 11. Hmm. I mean, someone said it's the end of irony. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Adorno said there's no poetry after the Holocaust. Well, these things, I mean, everything tends to settle out after a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, humor is obviously an important part of your poetry. Um, how hard is it to go to that well? Um, well, it would be hard if I didn't think I had a sense of humor in the first place. <laughs> you don't want to fake it. Um, but, I, you know, I, 
My father was very funny. I, um, my, I, you know, when I picked my friends in high school and college, they were usually we shared a sense of humor above all things. Um, but then I learned. I learned from models. I didn't think you could be funny in poetry, and I was right. You risk being um, consigned to light verse. But I, I learned from Ron Patchett. I learned from Kenneth Koch. I learned from Philip Larkin. I learned from some West Coast poets like Ron Kirchhey and Gerald Laughlin um, and Frank O'Hara, and now I'm I can go on. But um, I learned from them that you could be uh, funny and serious at the same time. That humor did not, a joke in a poem or a funny line in a poem did not um, render it impotent of creating serious, uh, a serious impact or having serious import. Right. Um, as someone who reads a lot of poetry, do you sense uh, new directions, new styles, new anything in recent years, especially among younger writers? Well, I think uh, just to bridge the humor question, I mean, I think there's a lot more poetry that is, uh, has some froth to it that is not, I mean, if you compare it to the high modernists and, and uh, the poetry or uh, the kind of level of difficulty that was sort of set as a bar by poets like Hart Crane. I mean, I can, I went to, you know, I have a PhD in English literature. I have, I have a taste for a typical text. I can show you my, you know, copy of Hart Crane with tons of nerdy marginalia there. But I think uh, people of, many people of my persuasion have drifted away from that a little bit. I mean, well, not considerably, really. But there's so much going on under the, the, the tent of poetry, uh, from spoken word to highly encrypted language poetry to, uh, to a lighter kind of uh, humorous poetry. It's almost as if the, the term has become uh, useless. It's a little like the term sports. You know, you would, I mean, you have under the t t heading sports, you have, you have badminton, you have professional football. You wouldn't have these people together on a talk show mm -hmm. to talk about this thing called sports. And I think poetry has the same, it's trying to cover so much territory. Right. And many written objects are called poetry basically by default because we don't know what the hell else to call them. Right. So. Right. Yeah, it's especially with, I mean, you mentioned spoken word and uh, juggling whether um, in a way that's its own art form or it's, it's uh, under the tent of poetry is, um, is an interesting kind of oscillation, you know. <laughs> well, I, I think spoken word or slam poetry is, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not, I don't know if it's not poetry. I'm not going to stand at the gates of the cathedral and say you're not poetry, but it's certainly written for a different kind of audience. I mean, it's written for a microphone, basically. And it depends on a good sound system. I mean, it's there to be performed. Right. And I think you can still make a pretty clear distinction between poetry that's written for a microphone and poetry for, that's written for a page. I write for a page. I give lots of readings, but that's completely secondary to my compositional attention. Um, I write alone in a room. Um, I've never taken a workshop. I've done a lot of terrible things in my life, but I've never <laughs> subjected myself to that. <laughs> And I'm writing for another person in a row, you know, uh, someone sitting there with a book and she's reading a poem, my poem, and, you know, it just started snowing out. And she hears a dog barking, you know, it's very, very yeah. intimate, quiet scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I, in the, in the slam poetry I've been exposed to, the volume seems to have, no, there seems to be no modulation. Like the volume seems to be set at uh, 11 to quote uh, Spinal Tap. <laughs> Have you ever taught a workshop? Oh, I teach plenty of workshops, yeah. I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me. But, uh, uh, when I say I never took one, I never really had the opportunity, you might right. say. Right. Because when I got out of graduate school, I got out of college, there was Stanford and Iowa. I think those are the only two MFA programs. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I gave it uh, about as little thought as I would going to, you know, dentistry school. Just, right. you know. Yeah, it's now it's kind of de rigueur. But <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's a whole, that's a whole other subject. Yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed. Uh, well, thank you.